try to follow my illustrious uh, colleagues uh, by giving a short lecture last time I gave. It's, it's just the tragedy of our times. Last time I gave such a lecture to the Georgian audience was in 2002, which is 11 years ago. And that was your current president, Mihail Saakashvili, at Yale University. It's a very rare. I can, it was funny, and I, I can tell you, yes. The feedback from Mr. Saakashvili later. Very curious. Uh, it's a tragedy, you know, we're neighbors. And we meet so rarely. And now when we meet, we have to speak English to each other because we don't share a language anymore. So I'll try to uh, follow the great line from one of the most intelligent conservative thinkers of 20th century and one of the greatest economists who really understood capitalism, Josef Schumpeter, who said that for world economy, one century is like one day. It moves very slowly, after all. Its structures are moving very slowly. So I'll try to bring us to this moment today by giving an overview of what, what happened since 1914. Since 1914, is, this is when really 20th century happens. Because you must realize, you know, of course you do realize, but we don't notice usually, that the best indicator of the change of centuries is not the calendar, and it's not economic indicators. It's the fashion. It's the way people dress. If you look people people dressing in 1914, it's still very much 19th century dress. Men with beards, or beautiful mustache, ladies in crinolines, well, those who could afford that. And if you look at the fashion in the 1920s, that's the fashion which is pretty much still with us. That's the leather bomber jackets coming from the Air Force. That's the bureaucratic suit with necktie, or ladies wearing some kind of bureaucratic suit. And that's, of course, the famous uniform of spies and secret agents, the Macintosh trench coat, you know, which you could raise the uh, collar up or there. Uh, and of course, another big turning point is 1968, or 69, if you wish, the Beatles crossing the Abbey Road barefoot in blue jeans and with men wearing long hair, women cutting their hair short, uh, to the opposite, and we're still very much in that fashion too. So in that respect, we'll live both in 20th century still, but in some respect also in some kind of a post-1968 century. So what was that? I'll try to center this on uh, this mini lecture on Georgia, since we, are, we have this privilege of being here. I'll try to connect big world trends, kind of Fukuyama style, to this place, at least. So let me ask you several questions. You know, first of all, do you realize what was the biggest producer of oil in 1914 in the world? Standard oil, right? So that's Rockefeller and, and Baku. And from Baku, how do you get that oil to the world markets? From Batumi, which explains so much, actually. Uh, for instance, why Karabakh ended up in Azerbaijan and not elsewhere, you know, all these decisions by the Bolsheviks in 1921 are very much about oil. And who was the American president who lost a lot of money in the Russian Revolution and therefore decided that revolutions are very important? It was Herbert Hoover, or Gerbert Hoover, as we, as we call him. What did he own in Georgia? I said mining interests, right? Mostly manganese. Yeah, the Hoover, uh, the Hoover Archive in, in Stanford, as you probably know, he was very traumatized. He lost gold in Lena in Siberia, and he lost a lot of ma uh, manganese and copper interest in Georgia. Uh, that was a big shock you know, for people like Rockefeller. Uh, at the time, you know, just one funny snippet of information, the country, which uh, later would be called Saudi Arabia, was getting its kerosene from Batumi. You know, there was a monthly uh, shipment. Uh, this was a very important place. But in 1914, if you need any argument to doubt capitalism, this economic and geopolitical system has committed suicide. Very much like Titanic, you know, it was a big, very technological enterprise. It could not sink. In 1914, the greatest powers of its time, and today we don't even think much of, uh, of them as greatest powers, but it was British Empire. It was not the United States. It was Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
hasn't been around for a while, right? It was the French Empire. Remember French Indochina, French Madagascar, French West Africa, French Equatorial Africa, right? And even Belgium with its Congo, and of course Russian Empire, they committed a group suicide because they did not calculate what it would mean using machine guns against machine guns, what it would mean 10,000 machine guns against 10,000 machine guns. Capitalism basically ended in a massive group suicide of its leading powers because they failed to calculate the consequences. Right, there are lots of instances actually in history when incredible events happened precisely because the elites failed to calculate the consequences. This is why the French Revolution actually happened in 1789. There were very smart politicians in France, but they were very smart about court intrigue. They could not envision people going in the streets and staying there and trying to elect executive bodies. This is very much like the Soviet Union had collapsed. Those of us who remember those times, you know, why did it collapse? Because nobody, probably including Zviad Gamsahurdia, for instance, could not envision Soviet Union collapsing, right? Even in August 1991, it was just impossible. That's why it collapsed. People behaved on the assumption that, oh, this thing will never collapse, so we can do whatever it pleases, and it did collapse. In 1914, nobody believed that capitalism could go extinct. It was at its pinnacle. It was like Titanic. It was a technological miracle. It did collapse. So what came out of its collapse? Well, first of all, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, for which you know, a major responsibility, of course, belongs to Georgians and Armenians, as you know. Uh, those of you, I actually tested it, you know, the old Soviet joke about Georgians, you know, Adin Gruzin, one Georgian is cult of personality, Stalin, two Georgians, cult of personality plus mass repression, Stalin and Beria, three Georgians, God forbid, we never saw it. Uh, uh, three Gruzina, oh, thank God, we never saw it. One Gruzin, cult of personality, two Gruzin, cult of personality and mass repression. That, why? Uh, why? Let me ask you. you know, uh, so what was happening, of course, that there was a very active revolutionary underground in this city and in Baku. And it was a terroristic underground with very special traditions. It was very ideologically motivated. It was riddled with spies and double agents of Ahranka. And therefore, believing that your comrades could be traitors was absolutely natural. And what do you do with traitors? So these kind of people come to power in Russian Empire, and they managed to win the civil war. And they, uh, they recreated the only empire which was recreated after the First World War was Russian Empire, not Ottoman Turkish Empire, not Austro-Hungarian Empire. And very soon, of course, you know, this was the beginning of the very rapid end of French and British and Italian and Belgian empires. Only the Russian Empire managed to be recreated by revolutionary terrorists. What is important about these revolutionary terrorists is that these people really believed in progress, they believed in technology, and they believed in exactly what Jeff described to you as this German school of economics. They were very Germanic kinds of kind of type. They were inspired by Karl Marx, but they really acted not on Karl Marx because Marx never wrote a blueprint how to do things. They really relied on other Germans, on the great planner of World War I, Walter Rathenau, and on the chief of general staff of Kaiser Germany, General Erich Ludendorff. So these were the real inspirations for the planned economy of Soviet Union and for the militarization of not just Soviet economy, but its entire um, population which basically became one military camp, one enormous uh, factory. And when you create one enormous factory, you have to take care of the people, right? They are your labor. Um, just one simple example. In 1917, in Britain, also a very seminal event took place. British War Cabinet introduced kindergartens or daycare at factories, right? Detsky Sadiq, why? It was not a socialist cabinet, because they knew that seven and a half million men at the battlefront as soldiers had to be replaced back at home in the factories with women. 
women tend to have children. And it's good because children today, 18 years later, become soldiers. You want healthy soldiers, you want patriotic and devout women, you have to build kindergartens in the factories. So this is where uh, World War I really gives the beginning to all the events of 20th century. Another very important uh, event, of course, was the coming to power of Nazis in Germany. Let me ask you one very important, very simple question. How many of you know uh, who was Obergruppensturmführer von Backe? Herbert von Backe. Anybody ever heard this name? Nobody really. He comes from Tiflis. He's the man who masterminded the Holocaust. Uh, he is the man who really invented the mass annihilation of Jews and gypsy. He was born in Batumi in 1895, I think. He graduated from Tiflis Gymnasium. Uh, during First World War, he was deported because he was German, and a local German. He was deported to Siberia by Russian Tsarist, Russian forces. Hated Russians ever since then. During civil war in Russia, emigrated back to Germany. He was one of the earliest members of Nazi party. Uh, since 1921, he was together with Hitler. And Herbert von Backe uh, became, once again, you know, any, since, well, okay, you never uh, heard the name, so you don't know what was his job. He had a job in the Third Reich. He was Minister of Agriculture. Minselhoz. So have you ever thought that the Ministry of Agriculture of the Third Reich was responsible for the mass extermination of people? And it was, because Herbert von Backe very nicely calculated how much food would Germany have to produce if they wanted to keep 10 million soldiers in the Wehrmacht fighting. They don't grow food, but they eat. They need another 25 to 35 million people in the factories working. And still, you know, there is the civilian population in towns. Is there anything left for Jews? Is there anything left for concentration camps? Uh, so it was the famous, and now infamous, in a memorandum which he sent to Adolf Hitler, uh, explaining that we cannot even use these people as slave labor. We must kill them if we want to win this war. Why I'm telling you these stories? Because uh, not only because it's, it's just incidental that Bakke comes from uh, Tbilisi, or from Tiflis. Uh, it just happened so that he was a very rationally thinking manager. Just like Stalin. You know, Stalin and Hitler are considered to be crazy, usually today. You know, we, we tend to dismiss them. And this is actually very wrong, because Stalin and the people around him, like Arjenikidze, like Kirov, you know, they went through very brutal civil war. First the experience, of course, of underground, then very brutal civil war. But these people knew their economics very well. They just admitted that in managing the economy, you can also kill people. It just so happened you know, that they had this experience. And say, somebody is speculating on the hard currency in your market. How to stop it? The suggestion from Felix Dzerzhinsky was, who was actually minister of economy in 1927, no longer in Cheka, just forbid dealing in hard currency and shoot publicly in the streets, 10,000 currency speculators. That would teach them a lesson. Right? Uh, Bakke, well, you can, you can starve to death 7, 10, 11 million people, you know, if that helps to feed your army and send it in battle. It was actually uh, both reactions from Stalin and Hitler were actually very rational reactions to the rise of American power. Since 1918, when the United States really won the First World War, because coming with one million soldiers, coming with all the enormous American potential for building weapons, it was clear that they decided this, uh, the fate of, battle, of the battle in Europe. It was also very clear that capitalism in Europe was finished. Somebody will have to replace it. So one project was the Third Reich. It could be the Nazis. And that would be a world order. Basically, by 1941, when Hitler attacked the Soviet Union, it was already a European Union fighting against the Soviet Union. It was the entire Europe, right, united under the Nazis. 
it could be, of course, the Soviet project of World Socialist Republic, and it could be the American project of globalization. Fortunately, as we know, in this triangle, and what is quite interestingly, you know, there are three powers, America, Soviet Union, and Nazi Germany, they thought of the other two as being basically the same. From the standpoint of Hitler, both America and Russia were Jewish states. They were run by Jews, Jews of the Wall Street and Jews of the Bolshevik Party. From the standpoint of, uh, standpoint of Stalin, of course, there was very little difference between uh, Americans and Germans. They were all imperialists and they were capitalist powers. Just kind of different kind of imperialists. And from the standpoint of the United States, which now triumphed, which is what we accepted, which we take for granted, these two, Hitler and Stalin, were just totalitarian, crazy despots. Well, it's quite an interesting triangle. Fortunately, in this triangle, two, that's Stalin and Roosevelt, with some help from Winston Churchill, united against Hitler, and Nazis were eliminated basically by surgery uh, from the body of world politics. And we are uh, devoid of that, fortunately, so there were two forces left. And as you know, after the death of Stalin, Remember, you know, Khrushchev denounced Stalin when? In 1956. Beria was executed in 1953. In 1956, the 20th Party Congress denouncing Stalin. 1961, they removed Stalin's body from the mausoleum, and still Khrushchev is not overthrown. Khrushchev lost his power not because he denounced Stalin in the Soviet Union, obviously. Khrushchev lost his power in 1964 when he tried to disestablish the central ministries of the Soviet Union, this enormous Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Light Industry, Ministry of Heavy Industry, Ministry of Everything, which were created in the 1930s, you know, the, which were essentially the equivalent of American big business and big corporations. This is what really cost his job. Stalin, they wanted to give up because if you are Soviet minister of anything, today you're a minister, at five in the morning, Stalin gives you a telephone call and saying, I don't like your performance. And 5.30 in the morning, you disappear into Gulag along with your family. It was a very difficult life for Soviet elite, for the Soviet nomenclatura. They got rid of that difficult life. But the problem with command economy is that command economy must have a commander. Without commander, Command economy becomes kind of Brezhnev style, you know, everything is bargaining for a bit more for my republic, a bit more for my ministry, nobody is doing anything. And kind of the Soviet Union is slowly drifting towards collapse. It's a big country, it had lots of resources, it got oil in the 1970s, it helped, so it was like a super tanker, it takes several decades before it collapses. But it did collapse, and remember how it did collapse. Can you really blame it on democratic forces? Come on, you know, people were still way too disorganized to overthrow the whole Soviet Union. Americans, I kind of doubt it, you know, if they wanted to get rid of Soviet Union, you know, why they couldn't get rid of Fidel Castro first? Why is he, is he still alive and in Cuba? What happens with North Korea? Why? I kind of doubt that, that uh, proposition. So my, what I suggest, and we can talk more about it in questions and answers, that the Soviet Union was disestablished by its own elite. So in 1989, Soviet elites saw what happened to East Europeans, to Ceausescu, to Honecker, they realized that, holy cow, you know, that next, uh, we are next, and as long as Gorbachev is in Moscow and he's crazy, and as long as we have protests in the street, which are being used by Moscow against us, so what, what, what is the escape? And there were two escapes, and both escapes were suggested by neoliberal ideology. Privatization. Remember, you know, what all democratic forces in the Soviet Union demanded in 1989? They wanted market, they wanted free elections, and they wanted sovereignty. So the position of any good politician in this situation should be, you want sovereignty? Okay, Ukraine is now independent. And I am Kravchuk, former secretary for ideology, is now your independent, very national-minded president. Remember Heydar Aliyevich Aliyev, who said that he became general of KGB only to help Azerbaijanis because he cared for his republic? Remember Eduard Amrosevich Shevardnadze, you know, who said many very similar things at the same time? 
So it was their reaction. Sovereignty, we become independent. Uh, privatization or markets, very good. You know, so I privatize for my brother-in-law and for my sisters and for my clients. So this reinforces my position. And the third was competitive elections. You, was, you want competitive elections? Fine. And you know what happens with elections in these situations. So all three slogans were snatched, very nicely used. The problem was that collectively this was crazy. Gorbachev was trying to negotiate from position of collective power, the inclusion of Soviet Union in kind of German-led alliance uh, of a bigger European Union. Now, with Turkmenistan, with Moldova, with Georgia, nobody was going to seriously bargain about admission, surely. You know, who needs basically these third world countries? This is what happened in this part of the world, and this is what, to conclude, to bring us back to American hegemony, what reflated American hegemony. They had their own problems. Today, it's even hard to remember. In the 1960s, they were killing presidents in America. There were around 400 terrorist acts every year in the 1960s in the United States. Race riots and all these things, you know, Martin Luther King, what happened to him, you know, Robert Kennedy. You know, we kind of forget you know, so how traumatic were the 1960s and then come the 70s and the crisis, economic crisis in the United States. They tried, like all politicians, you know, they made all the mistakes they could make. They pushed every button, they poured more money into the economy, and it didn't work. Remember, President Carter, President Carter tried to appease Iran and nothing works. They took American embassy hostage there. So what happens next? comes President Reagan, and he says, do something. Well, economic advisor said, and now you can actually read this. It's very boring, but you can read verbatim in PDF format online all the transcripts of internal negotiations in the Federal Reserve from the late 1970s. You can read what Paul Volcker is saying, but you have to understand the jargon of bankers. My colleague, Monica Prasad, in the University of Chicago, did this work. And I trust Monica, because Monica knows what she is doing. She says they obviously did not know what they were doing. Pretty much like when Gorbachev came to power, the joke was that Gorbachev could not mean what he is saying. But he certainly not knows what he is doing. But the truth turned out to be exactly the opposite. He did not know what he was doing. But he actually meant all these stupid things he was saying. The same actually is true with American Federal Reserve. They did not know what they were doing. They just, instead of lowering interest rate for the banks, you know, it was in the 1970s, you could borrow in the world for 2 or 3% a year. In 1979, it went up to 14% through the roof. Lots of governments went bankrupt around the world, but the money poured, you know, where, imagine if you have $1 million. Just not a very big sum of money, but $1 million. What would you do with it? OK, after you paid off all your debts to your friends, you, know, you bought a house, nice car, you have to invest it some, somewhere. But where? In China, tomorrow there will be another revolution in China. You know, and these people, are it, it's very difficult to negotiate with them. Where? Well, probably in Europe, but Europe is you know, they're in gridlock, you know, it doesn't function. Where would you invest $1 million? There are not very many opportunities in the world. So you go into the American stock exchange, most likely. New York Stock Exchange, you go into American equities market. You invest somewhere in the United States. Why? Because it pays 14% a year, and America cannot go bankrupt. You know, you, it, it's taken for granted. So money from the world in the 1980s and 90s, not, not just any money, but two-thirds of investment capital available in the world goes like into a funnel. Goes into the United States like this and disappears there. This creates, of course, this enormous prosperity, which I could experience and observe firsthand while I was teaching in Chicago. I saw what was happening with my house. You know, so my house was growing from 200,000 to 600,000, 800,000, and then booms, it collapsed and it is back to $200,000 again. All right, you know, this kind of bubbles, you know, going up and down. Uh, it was quite incredible what was happening, but it was also unbelievable. It cannot collapse. It's like Titanic. It's like before 1914. British Empire will be there forever. 
will be there for another 500 years. The Soviet Union cannot collapse. Yeah, it's after Brezhnev, there will be the second Brezhnev. After the second Brezhnev, the third Brezhnev, they will be dying forever, right? This kind of feeling which people always have, that what was shall be. It's like in the Bible. What was shall be. Что было, то будет. Everything flows and nothing changes. But it can change. This is what we're talking about. The 20th century had three great ideologies. Fascism, communism, and liberalism. Two of them were eliminated. Liberalism is about to collapse. This is what we're talking here. The question is what we're going to do next. Thank you.